I just see the tabernacle as such a great, great demonstration of what we're supposed to live like, what we're supposed to look like as a church, how we are to conduct services, how we are to approach God. And we have gotten so far away from that. The world has crept into every aspect of everything, including the church. And I just believe in my heart that Christ wants to give us clear instruction how to follow him. Many people will tell you in this country that they are Christian. Fine, but are you a Christ follower? Do you follow Jesus? And how, what is that supposed to look like? Because if you compare it to some other church, you compare it to some other believer, you compare it to what the world says, you're never going to get right. You're never going to get right. You have to focus on what does God tell us? What does he want? Let me tell you something. If you want something better, you have to choose something better. And for many of us, that means we have to commit to a change in allowing God to shape us and mold us. And that can be painful being put in the fire that way. But you have to choose that. And I know this, in every situation, when the presence of God is there, change happens. I believe so much in we are changing the world from Pine Grove. And that only happens through the presence of a living God. So how do we get to that presence? How are we supposed to approach that most holy place? So the, the, the tabernacle was, was a great place to start, but it really pointed to a greater reality. It pointed to the ultimate meeting of heaven and earth and the person of Jesus Christ. Listen to Psalm 16, verse 11. This is a great verse for the next nine weeks to put somewhere like on your... I, I like to put verses on my bathroom mirror because when I'm brushing my teeth, I can read it. And so, or if shaving, you know, you're shaving, you can see it right there. When the girls is doing your makeup, you can read the verse. Put it on your bathroom mirror. Psalm 16, verse 11. It says, In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In your presence, though. It has to be in his presence. And I think we see a drift, a cultural drift from, from what our relationship, our fellowship, our worship, what it's supposed to be. It's, it's not a rock concert. It's, it's, it's not, it's, it's not a, a, you know, a huge, massive gathering of 50,000 people. The presence of God and how we approach God is very intimate and personal. You don't need to jump around like a crazy person or scream or bark like a dog or act drunk to be in God's presence. There's an important lesson for us. We've gotten so far away to this point where how many times we heard people say, well, I'm a spiritual person. I have faith. I believe in myself. I believe in that, that nature runs its course. I believe that all things, you know, go together for a reason out there in the ethereal world. But God didn't tell us to have faith in faith. Jesus told us to have faith in God. That's where our faith has to be. Whether you're spiritual or not religious or whatever, it doesn't matter. You need to have faith in an unseen God who will reveal himself to you in so many ways. It's not just enough to get in God's presence to warm you up by the fire of the Holy Spirit. So many times people are afraid to get closer to God. They're afraid they're going to get burned. But the fact is it threatens our comfort zone. So we worship God from a safe distance. We keep him at arm's length. God, you can come into my home, just not into this room. God, you can come into this part of my life, but not that one. The church is tempted to have God go before them at a safe distance. But the pursuit of God is the central priority in our lives. A hunger for Jesus, a hunger for his presence. 
And unfortunately, too many of us have just put them in the men- penciled them in on the margins of our calendars and put them on the side, oh yeah, if there's time. But we have to see that, <laughs> here's the tough one. You don't get to come to God on your terms. Come on, church. You come to God on his terms. And his ways aren't our ways. And it'll mess us up every time. When we decide how I'm going to worship God. When we decide the terms for God in our lives. What have, what have terms have you set for God in your lives? What restrictions have you placed in there? Is it on your money? Is it on your time? Is it on trust? What is the terms that you've written? And maybe that's the beauty of the tabernacle, because it doesn't include our terms. It's only God's terms. Because the world teaches us so much about so many ways and paths to the Lord, to God, and they all lead to Him. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Where you, I love it when you go east and I'll go west, but we'll all end up in the same place. No, if you go that way and I go that way, you'll end up that way and I end up this way. What are you talking about? But that's what people do. All roads lead to Jesus. They preach that we're all going down our own road, but the destination's the same. The Bible says there is a way that seems right, but the end thereof is death. So you have to get out of your mind. For the next nine weeks. I know you'll look at me and say, you're out of your mind, but I hope you will say I'm out of my mind. I want to be out of my thoughts, and I want to turn towards God's thoughts. I want to get out of my terms of approaching God and look at his terms. And that's why we go to the tabernacle. If you could show the, the, the map, it's the third one, I think. There it is. Thank you, Anna. If you look at this, we have, this is kind of the layout and, and it was a pretty, pretty good size, and it was portable, temporary. They walked around the desert with it. You got this entrance, and that's where we're going to start off. Because so much of this represents Jesus and how we approach God. We have the, the entrance, that, that the gate, and that's what we're going to talk about today. When you get past that, the altar of burnt off- offering. So you would come in with your, you know, your first fruits or a goat or an unblemished lamb. You would bring them in your best and you would, the blood would be let, and you would burn that altar. And then you would, the priest would have to go to the lavier, lavier and lavar. I'm not saying it right, but that's okay. And they would go in and wash them, cleanse themselves. As a, so you've got the burnt sacrifice, the blood offering, you've got the cleansing. And then they would enter in through the door into the holy place where the menorah was the light, Jesus, the light of the world. It also had seven candles representing the seven churches of Laodicea. You've got the altar of incense where they would light, which would go ahead and symbolize the prayers offered up unto God. The table of showbread or showbread. Different way, uh, Jesus is the bread of life. And of course, of course, the, then you had the veil, which was this thick, 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 thick curtain. And then the priest would go inside once a year into the presence of God, into the Ark of the Covenant, where Aaron's rod was in there, some manna was in there, and also the stone from the Ten Commandments. So we have symbolism in this entire thing. You know, even in, see these little dots around here, they're the post. These little posts, even every little bit of post, the wood that was used was called shittim wood, and this wood was incorruptible and representative of Jesus. Incorruptible. It had beaver skin twine as, as also, also beaver skin on the top of the, uh, uh, as a covering, but it would also turn it into twine, which represented the strength. And then you also, even, even the uh, brass that was symbol, and the, even the... Uh, The stakes that they would put them in, they made sure that the stakes went down exactly halfway into the ground and halfway out, representing Jesus' death and resurrection. I mean, every single aspect you had around the outside of the outer court, around the entire thing, were all these posts that were representative um, and very specific that Moses laid out and how they would go. There was white linen to represent holiness all the way around. But today... We are going to talk about the entrance, which was about 30 feet wide. It was really a wide entrance to show that all that were repentant, all that were repentant could come 
into the outer courtyard. They could come into that place and offer an, to the altar of burnt offerings. The tabernacle links heaven and earth. We see there's only this one entrance. Jesus is what? The one way. The world teaches us that many ways, but he says the one way. In John 10, verse 9, he says, I am the gate. Whoever enters in through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Jesus said also, and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the gate that enters in to the Holy of Holies eventually. That is the symbolism we see beginning with this part today. So he says it this way in 1 Peter. For as much, 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 to 20 says this about it. For as much as you know that we are not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversion received by tradition of your fathers. But with the precious blood of Jesus, as the lamb without blemish and without spot, who was verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in the later times for you. What he's saying here, Peter's trying to say, look at in the temple, in the tabernacle, the tent of meeting also called, you had corruptible things. And this tradition of your fathers is now gone away because Jesus has come. Jesus has died for you. He is the sacrificial lamb. He has finished it all for us. It says, you were not redeemed with vain conversion received by tradition of your fathers. You're not redeemed by this. This was a foreshadow. This was a look to an example of, an object lesson, so to speak. God was desperate to be in communion with us. God did not, we can't approach God, but God can approach us. We don't know that way. He does, though. God conceived this. Also, it says in verse 20, it was foreordained before the foundation of the world. This pattern that we see wasn't God just putting something together so we could hang out with him. It wasn't God going, oh man, I, I blew it. I got to figure out something. It wasn't by surprise. This was foreordained. This pattern we see goes even from, and we'll talk about this a little bit, goes from the Garden of Eden all the way through Revelation. This pattern is really how we are to approach God in our lives. You were redeemed by the precious blood. Oh, come back next week. We're going to talk about that. You were not redeemed by these corruptible things. So why is this so important? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 tells us why we need to study this stuff. So many times, don't you? I saw somebody post on Facebook this morning. Had a great day, day yesterday. And once again, did not need to apply algebra in my life. And I laughed because I remember learning algebra going, I am never going to need this. But how many times do we do that? We look back and we say, I'm never going to need this. Why do I need to know this stuff? In this case, he tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. He says, all things happened to the Israelites in Exodus as examples, as object lessons to us to warn us against doing the same things. They were written down so that we could read about them and learn from them in these last days as the world nears its end. We, more than ever in these last days, need to have an urgency to make sure that we are getting the pattern right, that we are walking. And I know, don't get me wrong, Jesus is a, in God, they are grace-filled. But there is a way that his ways that aren't our ways. God has given us a path for us to approach him. Not because he wants to make it difficult, but he wants to have us experience his holiness. He wants us to experience the glory of God. But you know, if we just, if he just took a bottle of it and gave it to us and we opened up a bottle of God's glory in this room, we would all be consumed by it because we are not God. So we have to have a way so we are not consumed by it. When, when Nathan's hanging out with his, his boy, Levi, he can't just 
hold his hand and walk him around, what would he be doing? He'd be dragging him. Because little Levi can't walk yet. So Nathan has figured out a way for him to travel with Levi, right? He holds him like this, or puts him in one of those little hammock thingies, or puts him in a stroller. And, and Levi might be going, but I don't want that. I want to, maybe in his little brain, he's going, I want to walk. Well, you don't know how to walk yet. It doesn't matter. This is what I want to do. Well, this is the way we have to do it. There are certain ways that God wants us to approach him for our safety. His glory would kill. Remember Moses on Sinai? Remember he said, I'll pass by you. That's it, but you turn around. I'll pass. You can see the back. You can go to the back. That was all he could take. So the glory of God, imagine the power of a spoken word that creates a universe. And you think you could just walk up and hang out with him like he's your buddy? It doesn't work like that. God has shown us a way to approach him. And it's not that there's like some consequence like, oh, you didn't go to God, right? So you're going to hell. It's not like that. But I don't know about you, but I want all that God has for me. Amen? Everybody say all. <laughs> Thank you. I had to cough, so I had to say all. So there's this old Jewish proverb I looked up. This would make total sense, maybe. A bird may love a fish, but where will they build a home? So you got this bird, right? He falls in love with little fishy. He sees little fishy, and the fishy falls in love with the bird. The bird falls in love with the fishy. So the fish comes, comes right up to the edge of the shore, and the bird comes right down. And that's as close as they can get. Because a bird can't live in the fish's house, and fish can't live in the bird house. So what do they do? They can't habitat together. So here we were, the beginning of time. God created the heavens and the earth. He created the garden. He created Adam and Eve. And it says that God walked with them. That God occupied the, or the garden. And then Eve made Adam stumble. <laughs> so Adam, okay, Adam blew it. Adam blew it. They get kicked out of the presence of God. Because now we have a problem. If God's the fish, we're the bird. We can't habitat in the same place as God. We can't occupy. We're sinners. We are saved by grace, but we are sinners. What did Jesus say on the cross? We took on the sin of the world. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God cannot. It was a perfect being cannot. Perfect entity is probably better. Perfect cannot inhabit the same place as imperfect. Otherwise, it is now corrupted. And it says we are not saved by corruptible things. We are saved by perfect things. Heaven is a perfect place. And then we have to take on the righteousness and the holiness of God in order to share that habitat. So we have a fish and a bird problem. Where are we going to habitat? And that's what God said, you know what, I'm going to show you how I'm going to habitat, how we're going to occupy the same space together. And here's the pattern of how we're going to do this. I am going to make for you a portable tent of meeting, a place to go, because I want to be wherever you go. So he creates this. So we could commune together. Just like it was in Genesis chapter 3, they heard the voice of God walking in the garden on the cool of the day. And that's how God wants to spend it. You know, you know that word cool of the day is actually the word for wind? In the wind of the day. God was in the wind. Boy, have we heard that before maybe a few times in the Bible? How about in Acts chapter 2, remember? The rushing wind that God inhabited in the Pentecost, day of Pentecost. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because of the rushing wind of God. So, the, so here we are at the gate, the entrance to the tabernacle, a holy place. And God gives Moses these instructions in Exodus chapter 26. It says, Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine woven linen, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, with an artistic design of cherubim you shall weave them. This brightly colored 30-foot-long curtain stood out from these plain white curtains. You would see 
white curtains all around, but see where it says the entrance where the gate is. That's where this colorful, colorful gate was that was different. And everyone from the high priest to the common worshiper could enter through this single opening. And it's fascinating how we look at even just the opening of the church, of the, uh, of, of the tabernacle, the gate. It was the east gate. East gate. East gate had a, a great meaning to it. God ordered that when the tabernacle was set up, that this gate would always face east. Always. And the reason is because when you went west, you went towards God. When you went west, when you entered in, if, the, if it's facing east, you went west towards God. Going is east symbolized going away from God. Going west was symbolizing moving towards God. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, the gate, uh, the east, um, the gate in the Garden of Eden was on the east side. Cain went away from God, east of Eden. Lot split from Abram and went east and landed in the evil sites of Sodom and Gomorrah. In contrast, the Holy of Holies, the dwelling place where the Ark of the Covenant is right there, that was on the west end of the courtyard. It points to a future Savior. Every element of this tabernacle points to Jesus Christ. The gate of the court was the only way in. Just as Christ said, I am the only way, the one way. In John chapter 8, we figure it's facing east while the sun rises in the east. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The colors of the gate foreshadowed Jesus in the sense there was blue as the Son of God. The red for the blood sacrifice of our sins. And remember, before the crucifixion, what did the Roman soldiers do? They, they put a purple robe onto Christ, signifying that he, and they didn't even know it, was truly king of the Jews. He became the white unblemished lamb of God the only sacrifice worthy for atonement of sin. He became this, this, when the blood flowed from the scourge of the soldier. After Christ was dead, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, what did they do? They wrapped him in white, fine linen. The tabernacle gate of the court is easy to find. Anyone who wanted to seek him could be found. Today, Christ is the gate to eternal life welcoming all who seek heaven through him. The presence of God in you should empower you to walk boldly into the gate. What do we do? We walk in our, our Christianity light. Well, I, I guess i got to go see God. Approach the throne. I gotta go to I gotta go to work today, and they all make fun of me because I'm a Christian, or the, you know I don't want to speak up and hurt anyone's feelings by telling them not to talk that way around me. Ooh, poor me. But we are called to walk boldly, walk boldly into this. That's why that's why it was so wide. It wasn't you didn't have to sneak into the tabernacle. You don't have to sneak into God's presence. It's a wide opening for you. Walk boldly through there. And it should empower you. Where are you? Are you? Did you come this morning expecting the presence of God when you walked through these doors? Or did you walk in just to say hi to your friends, which is all good too? Or did you walk in because you like the music or because you want to hear the pastor? Or maybe it's just because what you do on Sundays? Maybe you wandered in, you thought it was a 7-Eleven, you were looking for a Slurpee and accidentally came here. I don't know. Did you wander in looking for something or did you come in hungry for the presence of God walking boldly saying, I'm going to magnify the Lord together. I'm here with my church family. I am not going to forsake the gathering of like-minded. I am going to magnify the name of the Lord. I am going to sit here or stand here and praise God in his presence boldly because of what he did for me. And then as you walk in greater obedience, you'll see that sin will be defeated and dethroned and set aside in your heart. See, when you look at the tabernacle, by the time we get to God's presence over here in the Ark of the Covenant, 
Only once a year the high priest could go in there. Only once a year. And just in case this guy didn't have his act together, they tied a rope around his ankle. Because if he dropped dead in there, they had to pull him out somehow without getting into trouble. Aren't you glad when you came in here today, nobody put a rope around your ankle? And that's because of Jesus. He is our high priest now. He is our one intercessor. Sin's enticement is no match for God in you. When you look at the tabernacle and how God set it up, and how he manifested it, and every little instruction, it was all for us. It was all foreshadowing Jesus. To say, start here. So many times we get overwhelmed. Well, I don't know my Bible that well. I don't really. Don't worry about that. Start it today. I'm going to start with the entrance. I'm going to come to Jesus boldly. It's a wide gate. I'm going to come in to the outer courtyard. I'm going to come in through that gate. And I'm going to have greater boldness. God is with me. Fear and vulnerability is going to be swallowed up by bold and sacrificial love. I'm confidently going to love those who will not love me back. I can sacrifice my time. I can sacrifice my money. I can sacrifice my resources, my energy, for the sake of others, knowing that any loss here on earth I have gained in the presence of God. The indwelling presence of God literally changes everything. It's about the way you view the world. Come on, folks, we are living in a time where, come on, you can't turn on the news without shaking your head. I love the, the memes on Facebook that, that constantly show where we've taken God out of things, and then we complain about it when they're all messed up. Yeah, that's easy to put on a meme on Facebook, but what about in your house? Come on, where have you taken God out of, and you've decided to take control of it? Is it in your calendar, your checkbook? Is it in your family? Come on, where, where are we doing this? You, you, there's a greater boldness that God wants to enter in. The indwelling presence of God will, will change the way you look at things. Access is forever open because of what Jesus did. No longer is it just one person who goes through this once a year. Jesus Christ tore the veil, tore the curtain, and now we can all enter into his presence because of this order here, the altar of burnt offering, the sacrifice of blood. When we look at who Jesus is and what he's done for us, that, that veil that is torn is so critical. But at the same time, when we enter into his presence, what are we doing with it? Is it to have the Holy Ghost goose pimples? So you go home and you go, man, church really made me feel good today. And sometimes don't you just want to go, oh, I'm so glad you feel good. But what are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? You come in here, you come into church, maybe you watch a TV program, listen to a radio, listen to, to some worship music, and then what are you doing with it? At great cost, God brings those who have rejected his presence back to his presence because Jesus humbled himself he dwelt with us in this fallen world and all who trust in him will get to dwell with him in glory and that's a wonderful promise but what are we going to do how are we going to get to this point how can we get into this point where when you come to church on Sunday mornings when you walk into your house when you open up the shower curtain when you get in the door that those are your tabernacles to be in the presence of God I used to tell teenagers all the time, I used to say, you know, when you are at your locker, can you come to Christ? Can you come to an altar call at your locker at school? Or Benny, how about when you're in the playground? Where's Benny? Is he downstairs? You look like him for a second and I glanced over. What's your name? Joey? How old are you? 12. Perfect. What is that? Eighth grade? Ninth grade? Eleventh? Oh, seven. I thought I was really out of it. My day wasn't called middle school. It was called junior high. Seventh grade was pretty cool because we had lockers. My locker was a disaster, by the way. I know that surprises you. But there was a kid down, uh, one locker down from me, right, right below me. His name was Chris Riley. 
Chris Riley was a born-again Christian. I made fun of him all the time. All the time, because his locker was right below mine. So half the time when anything spilled in my locker, it went into his locker. And I'd find some Christian way of making fun of him. But here's the difference between before I was a Christian and after I was a Christian. Even, even after I was a Christian, would I still come to Christ when I would open up that locker? When, it, when I would be around other people? Was I coming to Christ or was I acting as the world? Did I look like everybody else or did I look like Chris Riley? The problem is I look like everybody else. The problem is the church is starting to look like everybody else. And this is how God designed it, not what we think the way we designed it. So for the next nine weeks, we are going to approach the throne of God the way He has called us to do it. And it may not be comfortable. It may be a little hot because of that pillar of fire going all the time. But let me tell you something. If you want something better, then you have to choose something better. And if you want it to change, you have to get in the presence of God. And I believe, Mount Zion Church, we are called to change the world from Pine Grove. Come on, let's all stand to our feet as we close this morning. Mm. God, in your presence, everything's okay. In your presence, we can feel so secure and safe and know that you're in control. But God, we are stuck here on this earth still in mortal form. And we need your presence with us everywhere we go. Whether it's in our shower, at the locker, in our cars, in our workplaces. We need to walk through that gate knowing we have Jesus with us, the high priest. And walk boldly in the faith that you've given us. God, some of us are, are dealing with issues that real, real change has to happen, God. And we can't do it on our own, but I know in your presence, all things are possible. Our country needs your presence. Our state and county needs your presence. And thank you, Lord, that your word says that you so loved the world that you gave your only son. No matter how dark it gets out there, God, no matter how corrupt this world system is, we will serve the uncorruptible God, the incorruptible, the pure God and Jesus Christ. And we stand firm and bold in our faith as we walk, God, in your presence as we walk through the gate that you granted us access into your presence, God. I pray for over the next several weeks, Lord, you will change our worldly pattern into a godly pattern. That, God, we will not just worship you on our terms, but we will worship you on your terms. That, God, we will sacrifice our preconceived notions of how we think it should be done. And we will surrender to your wisdom, your will, your knowledge in the way it will be done. As on earth as it is in heaven. God, thank you so much for this wonderful church. I thank you, Father, that I have the privilege, that Debbie and I have the privilege of serving every day, these amazing people. Now, God, I pray you bless them. You keep them. You lead them. You comfort them. You heal them. And you enable them. Empower them. Oh, God, let us change the world from Pine Grove. In Jesus' name, the church said, Amen and amen and amen, amen, amen.